So before I start, I would like to thank all my friends here from the University of Lisbon for this invitation and the honor to speak to you at the closure of what will have been an intense and interesting conference. Yesterday evening, Rudolf Bernet spoke of the need to contextualize Deleuze's work so as to be able to define the specificity of his, of his contribution and of his philosophical thought. In what I will present to you today, I will be engaged in a similar operation, though in my case of retracing, of returning to the acknowledged and unacknowledged sources, particularly in the footnotes, uh, on the basis of which Deleuze and Guattari developed their concept of autochthony, which without this context remains, I think, utterly incomprehensible. I also wish to point out that my talk is, as uh, <coughs> Katerina already pointed out, is part of a book uh, that will come out in uh, January 2014, which is largely devoted to making sense of a statement in what is philosophy, that philosophy is not only essentially a Greek thing, but as a Greek thing, also geophilosophical from the start, that is involved with or, or uh, involved in the earth in a specific sense, and that this is what they, Deleuze and Guattari, have been doing while doing philosophy all their life. Until a moment ago, I did not realize that this book has been written as a response to my friend Nuno Nabej's evaluation of it. Uh, that paper made me also a bit too long, and if I don't get to the end, then I will forego the, uh, uh, the, the conclusion. Autochthony means sprung from the land, being born from the earth, hence indigenous, native, and or abor aboriginal. The concept suggests an intimate connection between blood and soil, noble birth and rootedness in the land, if not even an exemplary longing to the earth, and serves to naturalize being with one another and national identity. Considering the political, ideological, and ethical connotations of this concept and its valorization of having been born free of all foreign influence, <clears throat> it, is it not surprising to see that Deleuze and Guattari, to whom I will refer from now on as DG, particularly in what is philosophy, resort, not only without reservations, it would seem, to this concept, but also in a definitely affirmative fashion. As a political myth, autochthony suggests, especially in the case of the Greek polis, that the autochthon has a pure origin, free of all interferences by others, and that he has been there on the land from time immemorial, enjoying an incontestable and exclusive right over all others. Understanding the concept of autochthony in this manner, that is, of securing a noble origin for all the descendants from one and the same mother, Ge Meter, hence making all of them brothers in blood, Adelfoy, it is not easy to gauge the interest that the, that the G might have in this concept. Furthermore, the fact that we live in times in which ideas of community based on a belonging to a history, a common substance, a shared language, and so forth, have become more questionable than ever before, than ever before, and where the myth of autochthony is called upon precisely as a reaction against the insecurities that come with this uh, in, uh, 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 lack of a common, uh, this loss of a common ground of being together, it is even more surprising that DG would have resuscitated this concept. <clears throat> However, if it is rather unlikely that DG would have 
bought into the common connotations of the notion of autochthony, could it then be that in what is philosophy they presuppose or offer another, a novel conception of autochthony? Needless to say, while seeking to establish in what is philosophy that philosophy as it emerged in early Greece has from the start been geophilosophical in nature, it is the telluric dimension of autochthony that explains at first DG's interest in this notion. But there is an additional ideological dimension to this concept to the extent in which this civic myth is a male fantasy. According to which the Andres, the free citizen of the polis, owes his existence exclusively to the first male, the legendary figure of Erectonius, who indeed sprung from the earth and who therefore has come into being without the intervention of the other half of the inhabitants of the city, namely the women. Regarding this phantasm of the Greeks' genealogical fuses, to be autochthonous refers to the male citizen's self-origination and self-constitution. This motive, however, is not altogether foreign to DG's thought. Apart from explaining their deep interest in Whitehead's philosophy of organism, which has been called the transcendental philosophy without idealism, and the latter's attempt to overcome the Kantian Copernican revolution by arguing for an ontological autoconstitution of a new subject on the basis of its object, it would seem that it is their concern with a radical philosophy of immanence that has motivated their interest in autochthony understood as self-origination. As is clear from what is philosophy, the thought of immanence requires that of autopoiesis, the thought that everything is constitutive of itself, a thought according to which everything posits itself, brings itself forth by folding upon itself, by repeating itself, thus taking increase to the highest potential of what it can be only from itself. If rather than taking over the classical concept of autochthony with all the political, ideological, and ethical connotations, only certain dimensions of it are put to work in what is philosophy, in the context of Nietzsche's reflections on geophilosophy, its telluric dimension, and in the context of their ontological consideration, this concept's autopoetic dimension, the question still remains as to how autochthony is to be understood in the work in question, what its modes are, and on what level in particular it operates. What is philosophy does not provide a simple response to these questions. To clarify what the notion of autochthony is that DG have in mind, and in what way it might be a novel conception, I will have to operate a variety of detours and digressions returning to the Greek sources and the secondary literature on the basis of which they have reinterpreted this concept. I take the starting point for my elucidation in what I consider a rather enigmatic statement toward the beginning of chapter four of the book, the chapter entitled Geophilosophy. DG <clears throat> distinguish here between two kinds of deterritorialization one which takes place through transcendence, the other through imminence, that is, deterioration in imperial states, respectively deterioration in the city. The former kind of deterioration, I quote, tends to develop vertically from on high, according to a celestial component of the earth, end quote. As a result of the transcendence that brings about such imperial deterritorialization, quote again, the territory, the territory has become desert earth, but a celestial stranger arrives to re-establish the territory or re-territorialize the earth, end quote. By contrast, the deterritorialization in the city, I quote, and this is a sentence to which I will come back to repeatedly in, uh, in my, in my talk, 
the deterritorialization de in the city, I quote, takes place through imminence. It frees an autochton with a capital A. That is to say, a power of the earth that follows a maritime component that goes under the sea to re-establish the territory, between parentheses, the Erecteum, Temple of Athena and Poseidon, end quote. In the original, dans la cité au contraire, la, deterritori la deterritorialisation est d'immanence. Elle libère un autochtone, c'est-à-dire une puissance de la terre qui suit une composante maritime qui passe elle-même sous les eaux pour refonder le territoire, les récréants, temples d'Athéna et de Poseidon. The deterritorialized territory of the city is that of a milieu of imminence, in which the autochton is set free, or more specifically, in which the autochton citizen is liberated from one kind of autochtony and given another, a free autochtony. Spelling autochton with a capital A is a clear indication that it must be taken in a higher sense than what the term usually denotes which is further supported by the fact that such an autochton is said to be set free by the milieu of imminence that characterizes the polis. As you know, as you know autochtony, philia, and doxa are, according to DNG, the three specifically Greek traits. If the G translates this feature, these features as, I quote again, imminence, friendship, and opinion, end quote, there can be no doubt that the autochtony they are speaking about must be thought from as or from imminence. Now, the maritime component of the earth mentioned in the passage cited above, and by way of which autochtony is unmistakably linked to the opposite of the land, the sea, seems to refer to Poseidon, who, according to Athens' foundational myth, as it has been recounted by Apollodorus and St. Augustine, was first to arrive in Attica, causing water, the Erectinus, to burst forth from a hole on the Acropolis. Although the olive tree only appeared there subsequently upon the orders of Athena, the citizens settled the difference between the two gods vying for patronage over the site in favor of Athena, whose name became that of the city, while Poseidon went underground, or rather under sea, as the passage seems to intimate. I will re return in due time to Poseidon's place in the Erectus. In any event, DG immediately point out that the difference between the two forms of deterritorialization involved in the formation of the state and the city, respectively, is in fact a bit more complicated, since, I quote, the imperial stranger, end quote, who can be no other than Apollo Archigetes, I quote, himself needs surviving autochtons, and the citizen autochton one with the capital A, for his part, calls on strangers in flight, end quote, that is, strangers fleeing Imperial Asia. But the surviving autochtones, which uh, <coughs> in the French text is not capitalized, as is on the contrary, the autochtone freed by the city, the, uh, the surviving autochtones that the Imperial stranger needs are not the same psychosocial psychosocial types as the autochton liberated through imminence by the city. For the time being, however, I will concentrate on the autochthonous citizens liberated by the cities rather than on those that make up the imperial and colonizing states. But I will come back to them later on. First, however, a clarification of the notion of, uh, a deeper clarification of the notion of autochtony is required. As Nicolò has shown in the, the Invention of Athens, the funeral oration in classical Greece, in the, in the classical city, autochthony has been an obsession with the Greeks, especially with the Athenians, who seemed to have given themselves over to the delights of narcissism, producing an extensive discourse on autochthony, that is, on the Athenian citizen as having been born from the earth and remaining as such identical to himself, 
always excelling in his virtues, both in his verbal and practical acts. Composed of the pronominal adjective auto, self, which as a prefix can mean of or by oneself, independent from and beton, earth, land, ground, autochthonous means, as I pointed out already, sprung from the earth, indigenous or native, as opposed to settlers. An autochthon is thus an aboriginal, original, or indigenous inhabitant, a native of the land itself. It is in this sense that the original inhabitants of Greece, before the Indo-Germanic migrations that brought the first Hellenic populations, the so-called proto-Greeks, to the peninsula, at the end of the third millennium, could have been called autochthonous. <coughs> However, it is the Greeks who came well after them, who coined the epithet, not only for themselves, but also for their cities, which, unlike Roman cities, were fiercely reserved. Now, even though DG evoked in example eight of geophilosophy, the plane of imminence as the ground that the Greeks possessed autochthonously, with a capital A again. They claim that in the polis, a deterritorialization of the territory takes place through imminence that, and here I repeat the sentence uh, uh, again that I uh, quoted already before. Uh, they claim that in the polis, a deterritorialization of the territory takes place through imminence that, quote, frees an autochton, that is to say, a power of the earth that follows a maritime component that goes under the sea to re-establish the territory, the Erectium, Temple of Athena, Poseidon, and quote, seems to point to a different conception of autochthony and earth than simply suggesting, than simply nativeness, the, the nativeness suggested by the myth of autochthony uh, in class. A more extensive clarification than the one suggested so far concerning how DG conceive autochthony is thus warranted if we want to understand what they mean by earth and Mutatis Mutantis, Greek philosophy as a philosophy of the earth. However, such a clarification cannot be provided, as I said a moment ago, in a simple and ambig unambiguous fashion. It requires several twists and detours. Before attempting to define this other conception of autochthony, at which DG definitely aimed, in my mind, uh, and I understand that, and in the same breath, the different sense of earth that it entails. I interrupt my commentary in order to elaborate briefly on what Plato characterized as an, quote, opportune falsehood, end quote, in the Republic, namely the Greek conception of autochthony and the fascination with self-referentiality that it entails. According to the official discourse of the city, the Athenians belong to the land from the beginning, having been born from the of the earth itself. Yet if, according to Socrates, I quote, the story, the mythos, to be told to the rulers and guardians in the perfect state outlined in the dialogue, consists in telling them that they only dreamt that they have been educated and trained for their task, while in reality they were down within the earth being molded and fostered themselves, end quote. It is obvious that autochthony is itself of the order of a myth. Furthermore, when Socrates adds that, I quote again, when they were quite finished, the earth as being their mother delivered them. And now, as if their land were their mother and their nurse, they ought to take thought for her and defend her against any attack and regard the other citizens as their brothers and children of the self-same earth. End quote. It is perfectly obvious that Plato considers the myth of autochthony an inevitable political ideology required, on the one hand, to justify hierarchy in the state, and on the other, to secure, I quote, that all in the city consider themselves as brothers. <clears throat> Recognized as a political myth and a lie necessary to secure the cohesion of the state, Autochthony in the Republic is the object of a first demythologization, a first independent and enlightened treatment. 
Now, to further elaborate on the myth of autochthony, I turn to Nicole Moreau's studies on this notion, particularly in the children of Athena, Athenian ideas about citizenship and the division between the sexes. In this work on the Athenian myth of autochthony, on the one, uh, on one of the major topoi, in short, that constituted Athenian civic discourse, and by means of which Athens reflected its own singular status as a city-state. Loreau shows how Athens legitimated its hegemony over the other polities and defined what it meant to be a citizen by claiming to be the only people that never emigrated. Thoroughly different from the Roman territorial definition of citizenship, the Athenians equated citizenships with birth that is, with having been born Athenian. But as Lohan has shown, even though the polis defines its citizens by their autochthony, that is, as having been born from the soil of the homeland itself, this definition of citizenship took the form of two distinct, even contradictory, but also simultaneous and complementary conceptions of autochthony that coexisted in the city. On the one hand, a mythical auto autochthony, and on the other, a more life-sized or political conception of autochthony. It is for having pointed out this double nature of the conception of autochthony in Greece that has singled out Loro's study, since it may allow us to glean the one Greek conception of autochthony to which the G are attracted at the expense of an other. Autochthony either has been bequeathed on the Athenians by a male ancestor who was born from the earth, or it has been accorded to all Athenians collectively in a mythical past, which was later codified by the Pericleian law, Pericleian law insofar as they have been born on Greek soil from both a mother and a father. According to the first model, to be born an Athenian means to be aner, a man, which emphasizes the origin of autochthony in a memorial, in an immemorial event, in which the first Athenian was born from the earth itself, and as Laurent points out, without the intervention of any women. According to the second model, by contrast, it means to have been born from two, a mother and a father, and which stresses the collective autochthony of the Athenians and the foundation of their political equality. Even though, even though there is a child of the Attic soil anterior to Erectius, namely the legendary king of Athens called Cecrops, still half human and half serpent, who established the rudiments of civilization, I begin with the myth of Erectus who, according to Loro, is the central figure of the first version of the civic myth of autochthony. According to the story, as Hephaestus, Hephaestus is in amorous pursuit of the virgin goddess Athena, he spills his semen on the legs of the fleeing virgin. Brushed off by the goddess, the semen drops on the earth and fertilizes it. Thus, Erectius is born as the son of Geometer, or Gaia, the, the earth. Athena, Athena, daughter of Zeus, picks him up from the earth, rears him, and installs him as king of Athens in the place of the Acropolis, which he shares with her. Which he shares with her. Born from the earth, if not even from himself, as it were, because neither Ge nor Athena are really mothers to him, nor is Hephaestus truly a father. Erectus is the first autochton, through, though also divine offspring, who first, the first to enjoy Orgedaia, goodness of birth, and as such he is the ancestor of all Athenians. This myth of the legendary king provides the model of filial descent of all Athenian, Athenian men insofar as they are of the land. In the second version of autochthony, which is purely political, 
the city itself is the central figure. According to this scenario, which dominates the epitaphioi, or funeral oratories, the Athenians are, in Leroux's word, I quote, and this will be important for what I will say later, the, uh, the Athenians are, as in Leroux's words, born from the political earth. Whereas the first version states that the Athenians' autochthony is the result of one autochthon who is a son of the earth, the second model attributes collective autonomy, uh, autochthony to all Athenians who, as Andres Athenaioi, that is, valiant soldier citizens are ready to give their lives for the democratic city. Loro Loro writes that, I quote, as the founding topos of discourse about the city, autochthony tells the Athenian citizens that the city is its own origin, its own principle. The city is immemorial, end quote. It has always been in the same location and was from the beginning a political entity. According to this model, democracy is grafted onto autochthony. The latter is, I quote, incorporated by Athenians into the permanent occupation of Attic soil. The Athenians are thus the only legitimate inhabitants opposed to all those who are so-called immigrants and foreigners, although they are in fact on their own land that is, all the citizens of the other colonies, end quote. <clears throat> That's a quote from Loro. In distinction from the mythical account of the Athenians' autochthony, in which the first Athenian is the offspring of the earth, the second version stresses the human origin of the city's citizens, since only one who has been born from two Athenian parents on a soil that the Athenians have occupied since time immemorial is autochthonous, forming a city that from the beginning is political. The citizens are the result of sexual intercourse and are thus born, born from the children of the homeland. As already said, these two different discourses on autochthony, however exclusive they may be in positing birth from the earth or from human parents, are simultaneously present in the civic discourse on the origin of Athenian citizenships in spite of their contradiction. Now the point I want to make is that Ninji's attempt to think autochthony in a way that differs from that of the myth of being born from the earth for which the story of Erectius is the paradigm, which offers a model of filial descent, seems to be closer to the second political version of the myth of autochthony. But even in this democratic version of the myth, there is a lot left to be desired. Think about the status of women in the Polis. Therefore, we may want to attempt to make a new start, keeping in mind that DG not only approached the question of autochthony just from a, philosoph from a philosophical perspective, but also framed it with the question, what is philosophy? In other words, the G are intent on showing that autochthony is intrinsically linked up with philosophy as a great thing. This approach requires them to depart altogether from the double nature of the civic myth that informs the polis of official reflection on itself. To make this point, I will at this juncture pursue the question of, autoct of autochthony and the kind of earth it involves by following a slightly different thread within what is philosophy. As is well known, to be autochthonous has been for the Greek immigrants a question of great pride. This is particularly the case of the Athenians, who also had a foreign origin, although unlike all the other Greeks, they claimed to have always occupied the same soil. The Athenians, who contended that they are of the land, especially as opposed to those who came to Greece during the Doric migration, not only became oblivious to their Indo-Germanic origin, but as Praxiteia, 
shows in a passage from a lost drama from Euripides entitled Erectius, they in particular, they, and in particular the Athenian women, also confirmed their belonging to the Attic earth by eagerly shedding the blood of their own flesh and offering it to the thirsty earth whenever the city was in need. As Marcel Détienne and Julia Cisa have noted in The Daily Life of the Greek Gods, in a chapter to which D.G. explicitly refer in What is Philosophy, I quote, as it winds its way up from the Ceramicus through the Agora towards the Acropolis, autochthony is declined in the political masculine case. Only males, leaping to her defense, die for the mother country. Fortunately, however, Euripides surprised everyone by setting on the tragic scene a feminine version of Athenian autochthony. An autochthony for women, based on the strength of women, which re-explored the whole mythology of the origins of Athens." The story highlighted by Sisa and Etienne is that of Praxitea, Erectius' wife, hence Queen of Athens, and as her name suggests, the right hand of Athena, of Athena Polyades. She is the executioner of what is expected of the priestess of the Polyadic cult, who, all by herself and in no way as a mouthpiece for her husband, the king, sacrifices one of her daughters, Ptonia, thus showing, I quote, uh, uh, and Sisa, thus showing Erectus and everyone, all the assembled citizens, how an autochthonous woman behaved, how an autochthonous mother could shed the blood of her own flesh in order to offer it to the earth that is thirsty for. Shared by both men and women of ancient Greece, the myth of autochthony, if it has to have a philosophical dimension, will thus need to be reconsidered. Now, as Marcel Détienne reminds us, I quote, the earth alone is truly autochthonous. Also, she also tolerates the germinal thrust of one born from the ground itself. By considering themselves autochthonous, the Athenians sought to emulate the autochthony of the earth itself. Yet, as far as human beings are concerned, autochthony is not simply given to them, contrary to what the Athenians proclaim for themselves. For humans, autochthony is something that takes time to produce. Cisa and Etienne have forcefully argued this point in the daily life of the Greek gods, claiming that, I quote, autochthony was something that took some time to establish over several generations, end quote. Autochthony is thus a process, and in conformity with it, the Greeks developed procedures to deterritorialize the earth, in it there, as the sole power of autochthony, which tolerated nativeness only as long as it came with the regular sacrifice of the blood of those who, always already belonged to the earth, like Praxitea's daughter, Ptonia, or like Agloros, another female autochton, who sacrificed herself for the good of the city by jumping from its wall to the, her death. Undoubtedly, D.G. have in mind this meaning of autochthony as something made, rather than something that the Athenians possessed naturally. To clarify a bit the rather difficult passage in which they speak of the autochton, I follow up on a footnote that once more refers the reader to the Tien's, a footnote in what is philosophy, that once more refers the reader to the Tien's work, specifically to Kesken uh, Sit, an essay that serves as the Tien's introduction to a volume he edited, uh, Tracé de Fondation, and that interestingly enough, proposes a reflection on rituals and processes, I quote, that concern territorialization beyond and even in advance of the act of foundation. Etienne even uses in this context the term deterritorialization. It is in quotation marks. 
an affirmative nod, no doubt, to DG. But a piece that obviously serves as the background for DG's discussion of autochthony, although they do not explicitly refer to it, is another essay by Detienne in this very volume, an essay entitled Apollon Archeguet, a model politique de la, territori de la, de la territorialisation. With this reference, I also shift the focus away from the polis as city to the polis and the polis as states. Detienne opens the essay in question with the following words. There is an art of founding oneself, and certain Greeks knew how to raise it to a high level of perfection. If it is true, indeed, that most of the ancient peoples understood themselves as autochthonous by nature, most of them remained simply aboriginals, and this because undoubtedly they thought that the idea of foundation should remain foreign to the one of autochthony. From very early on, the citizens of Athens have made a choice to give birth to themselves and this without end." end quote. Etienne continues, quote again, at least since his yacht's cosmogony, the earth possesses the power of the self to engender the other, end quote. Yet this does not mean that the autochthonous earth, Emeter or Gaia, is simply driven, I quote, to found in all its alterity, end quote. Rather, this is what the Greeks took upon themselves, replacing natural autochthony with an entirely different one, one that is other than natural autochthony, an autochthony created through self-foundation on the basis of political freedom. Etienne writes, the originality of the Greeks, in all comparative simplicity, was to propose a political model of foundation." End quote. E.g., I submit, echo Etienne's claim when they evoke an autochton that is freed by the city by way of a deterioration for imminence and without inter any intervention of transcendence. According to the vocabulary, for the foundation of colonies that develops in the, 8th century, in the 8th century BC in connection with the creation of entirely new cities, especially in citizens and southern Italy. The founder is defined in terms of the activities of clearing the sites in foreign lands for the cities and of settling within trace enclosures. In Tesca City, Etienne invokes, quote, the care the founders took to render the site to be colonized desert-like, end quote. The foundational act thus amounts to a deterritorialization which detaches the site from all connections to the earth before it is re-territorialized. <clears throat> now, according to Etienne, apart from these two activities, a third term defines the founder. This first, this third term is archegetes, according to archegetes, according to Little and Scott, uh, to Little and Scott's Greek English dictionary, the archegetes is, I quote, the first leader, author, especially founder of a city or family. As a title of Apollo, Apollo archegetes, the term signifies that the god either partook personally in the foundation of colonial cities or showed approval of their creation by humans and that he would stand to protect them. Now, as the Archigetes god, at once the supreme leader, ancestor and founder, who, from the Panhellenic sanctuary of Delphi, that is, the navel, the omphalos of the world, dominates the entirety of the foundational activities, Apollo is the model for the human or psychosocial type of the founder of colonies. Since Apollo is the Archegetes god and none other than the celestial or imperial stranger invoked by the G when speaking about the vertical development from on high of the city, a remark about this Greek god by excellence may be warranted. Nowhere in the world, in the whole world, could the pregnant Leto, 
find a place to give birth to Apollo and his twin sister, Artemis. Because Hera, in her jealousy and wrath, prohibited the earth to allow the Titaness a place to deliver. Finally, the unhappy Leto found shelter on the small island of Ortigia, the island of, the, of Quails, in the center of the Scyclades, where she gave birth first to Artemis, who then helped her mother deliver her brother. Born outside Olympus, Apollo is therefore, in a certain sense, an un-Olympian god. Now, if Hera, who at times is depicted as Mother Earth, could not prevent Leto from delivering her children on this island, it is because she had no jurisdiction over it, insofar as the island in question was a floating or nomadic rock without any anchorage in the earth, bottomless as it were. Only after Poseidon later anchored it in the absolute center of the four points of the compass did the island, which until then went by the name of Ortigia or Adelos, the invisible, become Delos, the visible. Apollo is thus a god who, from the start, is also constitutionally detached from the earth. In any event, in gratitude for providing him a place to be born, the god laid the island, I quote, down as the center uh, of, the, of the Greek world and named it Delos, the bread. I'm quoting here from Grimald's mythology. Only after a year-long sojourn in the land of, her, of the Hyperboreans, I quote again, on the shores of the ocean, beyond the country of the north wind, end quote, that is, in the extreme north, where the swans that drew the chariot, his chariot, a present from Zeus, had taken him after his birth, Apollo returned to Greece. So he comes from abroad, as it were. In a way, he is a stranger to Greece, this Greek god by excellence. Apollo returned to Greece and made his way to Delphi, where a sanctuary that its people built in honor of the god is called the navel of the world. Now it is important to point out that this somewhat un-Olympian god, who is at the same time the Greek god par excellence, also spent most of his life on earth and among men. As the story goes, he was put to two tests. Once he had to put himself in the position of a slave in the service of mortal masters, and on another occasion, he had to serve as a shepherd or a cowherd in the service of a king, but also sometimes working for himself. Furthermore, most, though by no means all, of his deeds are on this earth. Now, with this in mind, let me return to the territorialization and deterritorialization that is involved in the creation of new cities. As Detienne argues, the process of creating cities on cleared land in the Greek world, which the settlers come to inhabit, inhabit, is characterized by two levels. I quote, I don't quote. First in the Pantheon, yet close to the human world and its cities, the process of territorialization occurs by way of the activity of divine power that is, through the god Apollo, who shapes the, play, the space and from whom originate the gestures and rites by way of which the sites are laid out, marked out, and cut out. For this Archegetus god, who has been born in exile on earth, has himself been expelled from the heavens and condemned to work among mortals. The career of Apollo, the Archegetus god, takes place entirely on the earth of humans in the middle of their cities. The gods of Olympus never found any cities in heaven. They are not architects like the Sumerian gods who trace the plan of the cities which the kings as builders of kingdoms carefully reproduce. The Greek city is never the creation of a god locked in the Olympus. Second, the Archegetus god in exile is joined by his totally mortal double, the founder often an exiled individual himself who seems to mimic the gestures that Apollo inaugurated. The founder 
as a human type, as this is the those again, as a human type in the Greek world, who is himself also often a stranger and a quote, a mortal homologue of the god of foundation Apollo Archegetus, exiled from the heavens, the celestial stranger, in short, creates on foreign soil cities that are independent from the lava land and its cities, cities that posit themselves absolutely. They are autochthonous, not because they are of the land and the earth, but because they have all by themselves and of themselves grounded themselves, deterritorializing the land and re and reterritorializing it onto a politically grounded community. This then is the concept of autonomy that DG linked to the Greek polis. And that answers the question about the sense in which Greece is the philosopher's territory of philosophy's earth. It is a concept of autochthony distinct from the one encoded by the official obsession with sameness and the fascination with the autoreferential, distinct from, in short, the myth of being born from the earth that dominated the official discourse, especially in Athens. Wrenched from the earth, the philosopher's earth as the deterritorialized by excellence is re-territorialized onto Greece as an earth that is constituted by the free and autochthonous citizens of the polis, an earth that in practice has also been much more open to foreigners than the official Greek discourse would seem to allow, which has also made it possible for what Renaud refers to as a miracle to occur in Greece, the miracle evoked in what is philosophy, the reference is there are several references to Renan, the miracle of the birth of philosophy in Greece. <clears throat> At the beginning of my talk, I grappled with the statement that an autochton is a power of the earth that follows a maritime component that goes under the sea to re-establish the territory, the Erechtheum, Temple of Athena and Poseidon. As you recall, this statement is made in the context of contrasting the kind of deterritorialization that occurs from above in the city-states as imperial states, as a result of which the territory has become desert earth in order to be re-territorialized by a celestial stranger, namely Apollo, to the kind of deterritorialization that takes place through imminence in the city, in the city-state as a city as a policy. I wish to make a further and final attempt to unpack and decrypt this difficult passage, whose difficulty derives, as we will see, not only from the translation of the original into English, but to some degree also from a difficulty in, of translation within the French original itself. What I seek to understand <clears throat> is how the autochton autochthonous efforts, or its autochthonous citizens, which has, or who have, been liberated through a deterritorializing imminence, composes as a power of the earth with a maritime component that goes under the sea to reestablish or to re-territorialize the territory in the shape of the erector. That is to say, the temple of Athena and Poseidon on the Anropa. Obviously, the talk of a maritime component that goes under sea makes no sense. In order to further clarify the passage in question, I base myself once again on Sissas and Detienne's The Daily Life of the Greek Gods, which, as the context proves, has been one of the G's acknowledged sources. I recall that from the beginning, a violent power structure, a struggle, at times a head-on clash opposed to Athena and Poseidon with respect to the, Athen to the Attican territory. I quote, Each produced evidence of their power in the territory. Poseidon struck a rock with his trident, and the sea water gushed forth right there in the middle of the Acropolis. Irrefutable proof 
that the Lord of the sea reigned over the highest part of the city. Athena, for her part, made an olive tree grow from the disputed land. When the dispute is finally settled by a court in which all men voted for Poseidon and the women favored Athena, the resentful Poseidon not only made sure that henceforth women were deprived of the voting right that up to then they had enjoyed. He also made, I quote, he also made the sea rush in right up to the Eleusis. This struggle between the powers of the earth and the sea in the constitution of autochthonous Athens is further evidenced on the occasion of the first war that the city had to win. This is the war between Athens under its king Erechtheus, born from the earth, and Eleusis, the territorial basin of Poseidon, <coughs> whose inhabitants had treacherously enlisted foreigners, namely the savage Thracians, to destroy the autochthonous city. Erectus dies mysteriously in the battle. Some suggest that he is killed by Poseidon, whose trident, trident, I quote, plunged into the Acropolis, opened up a tomb for Erectus, who was swallowed up by the earth. Walter Burkhardt, uh, which I have just been quoted, Walter Burkhardt, uh, excuse me, Walter Burkhardt, in Homo Lecans, describes the mark of Poseidon's trident as, quote, that little bit of sea in the Erectium, end quote. The depression made being, quote, filled with seawater. Rent into the earth by Poseidon's trident, Erectius, a power of the earth, thus goes under sea, as it were. Anyway, Athena, I quote, puts a stop to the violence of the god of the seas and pinned Poseidon down with his victim ordering the construction of the Erectium as a sanctuary of both Erectus, I quote, the most tonic one, whose body enclosed in the Acropolis rock helped to strengthen the foundation of both the foundations of both the city and its very autochthony, end quote, and Poseidon, the god of the maritime element, who thus is, quote, now integrated into autochthony. Indeed, the Erectium, which housed the statue of Athena Polyanus, as well as a single altar dedicated to both Poseidon and Erectus, is the temple of Athena and Poseidon, as the G note, since Erectus, according to Euripides' lost tragedy, Erectus, took the name of his murderer. Indeed, in Athens, Erechius and Poseidon are in fact merely two names for one single god, Poseidon Erechtheus, as Walter Burkert had, has argued on the basis of the fragment that remains of Euripides' tragedy. At this point, it becomes inevitable, inevitable to look once again at the passage that we are seeking to illuminate. I quote, an autochton is a power of the earth that follows a maritime component that goes under the sea to re-establish the territory, the Erectium, Temple of Athena and Poseidon. All the evidence we have provided so far does not seem to fully clarify it, or rather comes to an abrupt stop before the assertion that a maritime component goes under the sea. Although the passage does not immediately become clearer, when we go back to the French original, in puissance de la terre qui suit une composante maritime, virgule, qui passe elle-même sous les eaux pour refonder le territoire, end quote. After translating the French into French, it soon becomes evident that the referent of the second key is not in composante maritime, but on the contrary, in puissance de la terre. Retranslated into English, the sentence then speaks of a power of the earth that follows a maritime component, the former of which goes under the sea. In sum, then, as a power of the earth, the autochton follows a maritime component, and it is this power of the earth itself, rather than a maritime component, that in DG's work, in DG's words, goes under the sea to re-establish or re-territorialize the territory. 
In retrospect, all the mythological lore on which I have relied to dispel the enigmatic character of the passage leads me to recognize the decisive importance of the maritime element for a conception of an autochthony that is no longer earthbound. In order to extrapolate, to extrapolate just one of the implications of autochthony as a power of the earth that not only has a maritime component, but also gives this component an unprecedented leverage in the constitution of autochthony, I turn now to the paragraph that immediately follows the passage on Erectus and Poseidon that I have commented upon. A passage that speaks of the fractal structure of Greece and the peninsula's relation to the sea. But what is a fractal? I don't have to tell you. Uh, the noun and adjective were coined by Benoit Mandelbrot, drawing on the Latin adjective fractus and the verb frangula to break in order to designate discontinuous shapes such as a coastline, which is indented, and I'm quoting uh, James Blake here, which is indented by, quote, bays and peninsulas, revealing ever smaller sub-bays and sub-peninsulas, at least down to uh, atomic scales. Mandelbrot's concern consisted in finding a way to measure such non-Euclidean fractal lines. And he discovered that such measurements were a function of the scale of measurement, with the paradoxical result that ultimately such lines are infinitely long. In short, they crowd, as Blake puts it, infinite length into a finite area. Of course, did he borrow the term from Mandelbrot? The fractal. Although what interests them is not the measurement of such irregular lines, but their discontinuity, more precisely their indentation, the deep recesses that are set into such lines through which, in the case of the, a coastline, the sea presses inside the land. Of, Greek, these, of Greece, DG assert that, I quote, each point of the peninsula is close to the sea, end quote. Indeed, in addition to its mountainous landscape, a major feature of the Greek landscape is, and I quote here from François de Fèvre, is that the sea is always less than 100 kilometers away from any point of the territory where one happens to find oneself, and conversely, when one sails in the Aegean Sea, one never has to travel more than 60 kilometers in order to reach land that always remains inside. I'm coming closely to my conclusion, to, my, to the end. Rather than being isolated and closed upon itself, self-sufficient and autochthonous in a narrow sense, each point of Greece opens upon the open sea, through which it becomes deterritorial. Each point also has, therefore, an irregular shape. It is not a well-rounded whole, but divided from within by the shores of Greece that have great length, and through which it is inexorably exposed to the other that or who comes across the waters. Each point, that is, each city of Greece, has, as DG say, a fractal structure. In other words, it has an irregular and fragmented shape in the sense that through its porousness and the rate of flow by which it is exposed to the outside, it exceeds in this symmetric fashion its topological dimension. Each point of the topological space of Greece is pulled inside out, as it were, by its openness to the sea i.e. to the fluid medium in which encounters with the other, the stranger, occur. The first implication of this fractal nature of Greece is that each city, particularly autochthonous Athens, is a commercial city. Uh, I won't go into uh, details of that aspect here. But rather than following the oriental model of imperial verticality, the polis is, as you know, a horizontal milieu free of all hierarchical structures of the citizen, Excuse me, for its citizens. But that milieu knows no enclosures. It exceeds the spatial dimensions that would constitute it as an interiority. 
As we have seen, the Erectio, at the center of autochthonous efforts, is the temple both of the fabulous king Erectius, son of the earth reared by Athena, and of Poseidon, the god of earthquakes, of water, and also, though only secondary, of the sea. The sanctuary that dominates the center of the city houses both the firstborn of the earth and the one who, as his title suggests, makes the earth tremble and extends the milieu of the polis outwards upon the sea. In it, the Greek palace is the result of a thorough deterritorialization of the earth that effectuates a social political milieu of imminence in which its inhabitants can freely compete with one another. With its openness to the sea, the city state also leads to a re-territorialization upon the sea, with the result that navigation becomes one of its principal vehicles of exchange, making it the colonizing and commercial power in, uh, in the Mediterranean. And if I had time, this would be also the place to talk about the Persian War. The police itself is thus like a fluid expanse in which all its free and mobile citizens compose a whole insofar as they are first in commercial relations with one another. The artisans and merchants who are, stepped, uh, who are steeped in this milieu of imminence find here, as DG remarked, a quote, a freedom and a mobility denied to them by the empire. These types come from the borderlands of the Greek world, strangers in flight, breaking with, its, with empire and colonized by peoples of Apollo, not only artisans and merchants, but philosophers as well. The milieu of imminence offered by the polis is not just any milieu. It is not a middle as a space of mediation and of reconciled opposites, a space of speculative fullness. As a milieu of artisans, merchants, and philosophers, the polis exceeds all mediating closure upon itself. It is defined by the attraction that it exerts upon artisans and merchants, as well as upon the philosophers who come to it from abroad as a place to think in competition with other thinkers. As Clemence, as Clemence Ramoux, uh, who uh, DJ refers to, uh, but, but also Nietzsche have pointed out, the philosophers were to a large extent foreigners. And pre-Socratic philosophy, significantly enough, emerged toward the end of the 7th and the beginning of the 6th century BC along the borders of the Orient in Ionia, that is in Asia Minor, before it wins over the extreme west Sicily and Italy. It is also in the 6th century that the first schools of philosophy emerged emerged, which also happened to admit among human beings those others that are women, such as the Pythagorean philosopher Theano, or, although much later, slaves such as Epictetus, who taught Stoicism at Nicopolis and Rome. Following Gamnu, the G write, philosophers are strangers, but philosophy is Greek. The word philosopher, no doubt, was invented by Heraclitus, but the correlate word philosophy is platonic in short Greek. Anyway, the Greek polis, with its fractal nature and openness to others, is not only characterized by its commercial relations, it is also a haven, a haven for philosophers. Indeed, it is in Greece that these foreigners, lovers of a kind of wisdom that already takes them out of the company of the sages, find an opportunity to do something that, rather than being something foreign, is essentially Greek, philosophy. It is worth noting here not only that philosophy as essentially Greek develops in Greece thanks to the attraction that its milieu offers to strangers, but also that the stranger as a question and a topic is an intrinsic part of its discourse and concern, at least from Plato on. In the context of a discussion of the figure of the stranger of the Xenos in Plato's Sophist, a note in the chapter Conceptual Persona that refers to Jean-François Matéis d'Etranger et le Simulacre, et le Simulacre shows that in thinking about philosophy as a Greek thing, D.G. 
take into account not only the fact that it is a stranger from Elea who in Western philosophical thought makes for the first time the point that dialogue, even though far from being a peaceful and amiable exchange, is founded by Locos in reason, but also the fact that the speculation about the relation between self and other, that is the dialectic of identity, is also an unmistakable Greek problematic. Furthermore, by contending that non-being is and that in some regards being is not, this stranger in the dialogue critically takes on within Greek thought, Greek thought itself, or more precisely, the fundamental foundation of the Greek way of conceiving of identity and within this thought engages in nothing less than a kind of parasite of the father figure Paris, uh, Parmenides. Indeed, in this late dialogue of Plato, the genre itself of the author of the Hetheron, as opposed to the same, erupts into Greek thought. Thanks to the philosophy of a stranger, I quote a new, I'm quoting here, uh, Henri Joly, a new way of saying and thinking the same, and uh, takes place, and categories that until then remained eccentric and quote, now gain access into the heart of philosophy, language, and being itself. As is also evident from the politicos, the stranger is an active persona in Greek philosophical thought, and so is the topos of the stranger and the other itself. Since the Greeks, this concern with the other has remained a hallmark of philosophical thought in the West. And this, I think, is one of the points that DG made in what is philosophy. Thank you.